Great. Well, welcome, everybody. This is the first of uh, two webinars we're going to be offering in the early part of 2022 here um, around sort of generally the specialty mushroom industry, but we're going to be focusing on some of the food safety regulatory questions that we often get in this first webinar and then um, follow up with a webinar in February about production practice certifications like certified organic, certified naturally grown, et cetera. So I'm excited to have some wonderful presenters here, as well as an active farm that can speak a bit to the experience they've had um, uh, working with these regulations and systems. Before we hand that off, I just want to mention our homepage for the Specialty Mushroom Project, which you can find at smallfarms.cornell.edu slash project slash mushrooms, or simply cornellmushrooms.org. If you go to the homepage and scroll down, um, you'll find links to our any upcoming events um, in particular the one we're focused on today is listed below where we have our online course listings and if you've registered already for this um, you'll get a connection link for the second webinar coming up in february if you're watching the recording or haven't registered then you can find this page and click on register and add your name to the list we'll make sure you have the connection details for next time other thing I want to mention on this uh, page here is just some follow-up resources. We have a whole bunch of different materials to peruse around mushroom production, but pertinent to these topics, if you go under economics and markets in this sort of tile menu, um, you'll find uh, resources that are going to help sort of expand upon and, and allow you to dig deeper into some of these some of these questions around regulations and food safety and when I have to comply and not comply. And so on this page, you'll find um, uh, image that, that helps kind of walk you through some of the different considerations depending on the types of mushrooms and the types of products you're looking to potentially provide. Um, and then uh, we have a whole harvest to market guide and, and embedded in this guide are different sections uh, dealing with various uh, topics, in particular to today's presentation um, in section one the A part here, you're going to find a lot of links and additional resources and some articulation of some of the best practices for handling mushrooms and things like that post harvest. So do check that out um, through the cornellmushrooms.org page as a follow up to the presentation here. And with that, I'm going to um, pass it to my colleague Yolanda Gonzalez. Great. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, hi everyone. Um, my name is Yolanda Gonzalez. I'm with Cornell Cooperative Extension. I'm an urban ag specialist with the Harvest New York Urban Ag team based in Brooklyn. I work with commercial urban growers and um, a few urban mushroom production growers. So today we'll be covering um, GAPS, Food, uh, Food Safety Modernization Act or FISMA, um, as well as just getting a general sense of um, a farmer's experience with navigating all these food safety uh, regulations. So on the agenda today, we'll cover just basics on food safety and also mushroom food safety. We'll talk about the microorganisms of concern and sources of contamination to look out for. We'll give some more, I'll be providing more of a background on FISMA and talking about exclusions, exemptions, are you covered or not within FISMA regulation, and then additional resources. I'll then hand it off to Robert Haddad, who will talk about GAPS, and then um, I'll hand it off to Hannah um, Shufro, who will be talking about um, how to navigate all these different regulations around GAPS specifically. So what comes to mind when I say mushroom food safety? I'd love to hear your thoughts if you can put in the chat. Um, if you think of, what do you think of in general? Um, mm -hmm when you think about mushroom food safety. Mm How -hmm. to avoid contamination, mold, bacteria, okay. How to prevent people from getting sick, yep. That's, that's the main, goal really behind food safety. Um, so for being in New York City, um, another uh, point of concern is making sure that you're growing in substrates that's free of any um, heavy metal contamination. So being in an urban environment, a lot of times there's high levels of soil lead 
And so as mushrooms are extremely sensitive to their environment and they can take up or uptake, you know, these heavy metals into their fruiting body, you do want to be careful of using substrates that are free of contaminants. Um, and also foraging. And, you know, if you do stumble upon mushrooms, let's say at, at a public park or something like that, you also want to be mindful of proper IDing. We have a saying, when in doubt, throw it out. So that's also part of um, food safety as well. For the purpose of our course um, here, we're going to be talking about um, concerns of foodborne pathogens. So not necessarily looking at heavy metal contamination, while that is within the realm of, of food safety, it's not going to be what we'll be covering in today's session. Um, and I wanted to just point out these two photos here. So the one on the left is of a grower that is intercropping garlic with wine cap mushrooms, which is also my background here. Um, this is from a CME or a community mushroom educator um, who is growing mushrooms um, in their garden. So that's my background here. But this photo here is of a um, rooftop farm that's growing primary crops for hot sauce and intercropping with, with wine cap. So that's a great use of maximizing small spaces in an urban environment. And then here, this photo is almond agaricus, also intercropped um, with a, a very popular crop, it's cucumbers. But in both cases, they're um, being grown in uh, substrates that are free of contaminants. So that's just one consideration when you're looking at mushrooms in urban environments. But in terms of, um, you know, for like I mentioned, our purpose today will be covering food safety and microorganisms of concern, particularly, you know, bacteria. So listeria, salmonella, things like that. In 2020, these are two kind of big examples of outbreaks. One happened with enoki mushrooms and the other with dried wood ear mushrooms. So this is the type of situation that we all want to we will all want to avoid, right? Um, we mentioned in the chat box that when we think about mushroom food safety, we're really thinking about how to prevent people from getting sick. So how to prevent cases like these from um, getting people sick, essentially. And again, why is it important you're preventing and reducing risks on your farm? Um, you know your farm and your practices better than anyone. Um, so knowing what the consequences are of certain practices and trying to avoid them and protecting the local food system and you know, the ever expanding um, specialty mushroom industry in New York and throughout the Northeast, really protecting that industry as a whole too. And um, some buyers may require certain aspects of food safety, which we will be getting into uh, later in the session as well. So I mentioned microorganisms of concern, um, one of them being bacteria within that Realm of bacteria, I mentioned the salmonella and the listeria example, um, but there's also other um, microorganisms of concern like neurovirus, hepatitis A, parasites to be aware of as well. So these three categories are the three main categories, um, the microorganisms of concern that we're really looking to um, prevent as much risk as possible on the farm. So with bacteria, they're microorganisms that can multiply both inside and outside of host. Um, they include pathogens, like I mentioned before, salmonella, listeria, and they can multiply rapidly given the right conditions. So water, food, and the proper temperature, but good agricultural practices can reduce these risks so that you're really um, not supporting the survival and the growth of bacteria. And again, viruses, um, they multiply only in a host, not in the environment. Contamination is often linked to an ill worker handling fresh produce or contaminated water. Um, so this is something to think about within, you know, mushroom production. A lot of times you're soaking water. So, um, and also having multiple people handle um, mushrooms, whether it be uh, processing them or um, just handling them by harvesting them. So prevention is really key with reducing viral contamination. And then parasites or protozoa or intestinal worms that can multiply in a host animal or um, a human. And they're commonly transmitted by water and can be very stable in the environment as well, often not killed by chemical sanitizers. Um, and they can survive in the body for long periods of time. 
And when we think about, you know, preventing people from getting sick, the most vulnerable populations include children, pregnant women, older women, older people, um, and people with weakened immune systems. So some of the challenges, um, maybe not necessarily with mushrooms, but if you're thinking about um, like in general, produce has a lot of natural openings and stem scars and bruises. It could have rough surfaces or folds and netting. So in general, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to reduce the risk or to um, reduce risks in general, right? So kind of keeping those things in mind and understanding that um, with fresh produce, there is no kill step. And so a lot of times um, people don't, there are people that consume mushrooms raw. So you wanna handle it like, um, like a fresh uh, produce. And so it is covered under the produce safety rule, which we'll get into, um, right? How are mushrooms, specialty mushrooms, not on the barely consumed raw list? Yeah, that's a really good question. For our purposes, um, we'll be getting into those specifics and I have a list of the rarely consumed raw um, produce and I'll get into that in a bit. Yeah. So some contamination sources, um, I mentioned humans, um, animals, um, water and people. So your workers that are handling the fresh mushrooms as well. And then um, FISMA versus third-party gaps. This is a really big distinction. So FISMA is Food Safety Modernization Act. It's regulated by the FDA. So it's a federal um, regulation that farms have to comply with if they are um, a given size, which I'll go into um, the specifics of that in a bit. But there's farm inspections versus audits. So if you are undergoing a gap certification, there'll be an auditor that will be coming out to your farm as opposed to an inspector. So um, a GAP certification is essentially a buyer imposed program. So it's voluntary. Let's say you have um, either a farmer's market that you wanna join or you wanna um, sell your mushrooms at Whole Foods, they may require a GAP certification. And so that's sort of the distinction between these two that's really important to keep in mind. Whenever we say FISMA, we mean federal, it's regulation by FDA, and there are inspections versus gaps where it's, again, voluntary buyer-imposed program um, that requires an audit and a gap manual. And some of the, the um, reasoning behind um, PSR, the produce safety rule, focus on the growing, harvesting, and post-harvest handling of produce, focuses on prevention, um, not detection of issues, and it's really, the, it was the first ever mandatory regulation for production, harvest, and handling of fruits and vegetables. And it falls within all these other categories within FISMA as well. So um, just, there's a lot of other components within FISMA. There's preventative controls for human food, for animal food, and so on. So it's part of a larger regulation for food safety. And a few exclusions and exemptions, which I'll be going into. Um, again, I mentioned before about having this kill step and um, being under the PSR produce safety uh, regulation. So if something like potatoes that does have a kill step because you don't eat potatoes raw, that would be, it would be exempt, right? So that's sort of the difference between um, being exempt versus being included in the rule. And then um, to further um, understand this concept of qualified exemptions, if you are more than half of your average annual monetary value of the, the food um, in the last three years uh, adds up to $500,000, then, and you're selling um, within a 250 mile radius from your farm, then you are qualified exempt. And in order to keep your qualified exemption status, you would keep a record of your produce sales within the last three years. Feel free to put any questions in the chat. Um, so there's an, a difference between exempt 
and excluded. You're excluded from the rule if you um, make under 25,000 a year. And I mentioned covered produce, so that's anything that is um, not on, um, anything that falls within that covered produce list that I will show in a second. So all these things are rarely consumed raw, right? So anything that um, is in this list would be excluded from the produce safety rule. So I hope that wasn't too confusing trying to understand the exclusions and exemptions, but essentially um, something like, you know, potatoes or beans or things that um, would need to be cooked are excluded from this. But in this case, mushrooms are included under the produce safety rule. So that's something really important to distinguish with whether something is included or excluded or not. So if you wanna learn more information and get um, and go through a training, a grower training, you can visit the Produce Safety Alliance website and there's actually a listserv on here. And there's a column on training. If you click on grower training courses, um, there's an option for in-person, online, remote delivery course. Um, and also, it, well, there's a distinction, um, online and remote. So online is spread throughout the course of a few weeks. The remote delivery option is usually two days. So it's four hours each day. And so there's different options on here if you wanna take a look um, and sign up for a course in the next few weeks. And also again, to reiterate, uh, Steve walked you through where to find all that information on our website, um, but it's under economics and markets. So I'll pass the floor now to Robert if you wanna unmute yourself. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's put that on there. Um, so yes, hi, I'm Robert Haddad. I'm with, our, I'm with Cornell Cooperative Extension also. Uh, I'm part of the regional um, vegetable team out in Western New York. We cover 14 states, uh, yeah, states, that's what it seems like sometimes, 14 counties. Um, uh, uh, in, in that half of the state. Um, uh, but uh, food safety is one of the uh, big hats that I wear and I have statewide responsibilities uh, for that. Uh, so I'm all, I'm all over the place uh, with, with trying to do uh, educational outreach, um, do like layout and design of uh, facilities, um, wash pack training, uh, do some research when we can. So, um, but uh, yeah, I started out about 15 years ago doing this uh, and all we had to work with is, was, was GAPS, Good Agricultural Practices. So uh, next. Uh, so uh, it, it's really the, the GAPS program picked up. Uh, it, was, it was voluntary uh, in, um, and, and, it, and it still is for the most part. Uh, it was created by USDA. Uh, but uh, industry, uh, well, uh, they, they were there was they were worried about more incidents of, of foodborne illness, and uh, were looking to to uh, have a program that, that growers could could follow, uh, have an audit and become certified, uh, so that it would help improve um, the, the 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 safety of of produce going in, in into some of these marketplaces like like grocery stores. Um, and it, it just seems like there, there's more, uh, we're seeing more incidents of, of problems. Um, and as mentioned before, um, you know, there, there's people are living longer, there's more immunocompromised folks, uh, people eating more raw products, you know, eat your fruits and vegetables. Um, and then uh, availability uh, is, is year round for, for lots and lots of different things. So there's, there, there's this plenty of produce out there. Uh, and so the, so the incidence levels have, have kind of kind of jumped up. Um, uh, we're, we're seeing more imports coming in. So uh, when comparing uh, imported to domestic uh, illness outbreaks, uh, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference in the number. Um, in, um, so 
But as we all know, uh, lots of illnesses are never reported. So there may be outbreaks that, uh, small outbreaks that, that are being missed. Um, so we, it, it's something that we need to keep in mind uh, as well. Uh, also, uh, some of the some of the, these problems, uh, like like bacteria, are evolving. Uh, like listeria has uh, become um, it, it can survive in harsher uh, temperature differences. It, it, it can reproduce in temperatures as low as thirty two degrees. Uh, so uh, and it can survive temperatures over one hundred and thirty. Um, the E. coli 0157H7 was unheard of prior, prior to the uh, early 1980s. Uh, and that's a, a new subspecies that, that has, uh, has, has shown up. Um, and uh, actually several more have as well. Uh, there's been a lot more media attention, uh, partly because there's been a lot of litigation. So when the lawyers get involved, uh, then it, become, it becomes news. Uh, next. Where to go? <laughs> I'm going to reshare for a second. Sorry about that. Okay. Actually, I'm going to go back and open it from the, I'm going to refresh from box. Just trying to follow along in the chat, the article, Steve, that you posted, <laughs> and then it popped up. It kicked me out of this one. Okay. Well, over the years, I mean, within within New York, we we de developed a, a the the, Ga the gaps training um, that uh, was was co written between uh, uh, but Betsy Bin from Cornell uh, Food Science and myself and uh, from the Veg Team and Craig Kalki from the Fruit Team uh, to create uh, a, a training. Um, that consists of a full day of principles and practices uh, and following, and then followed by a second day of uh, helping growers write a farm food safety plan. Uh, and uh, so, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So we'll get back to this. Uh, so really what's the, 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 the five, there's lots of reasons for food safety. The five top reasons are, are as follows. Uh, and it's already been mentioned, we don't want people getting sick. Um, so there's, there's uh, you know, with the way the food system is and things, how things get, get, get transported and handled across the country, uh, widespread outbreaks uh, have become a lot more common. Uh, and then in vulnerable um, folks, uh, they can get sick enough to, to have permanent damage or even death. Uh, and as so, uh, as mentioned before, you know, older folks and 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 all the rest are, are can be very susceptible to that. Um, another big reason that we're you know, concerned about these types of outbreaks because it really affects your business, um, and not just you know uh, the, a, a single farm, but an entire industry. Uh, on that, all the growers who are growing the same thing. Back in 2016, there was an outbreak of E. coli in spinach in California uh, that had ripple effects uh, clear across the country uh, for all spinach growers. I remember like within the first week, uh, there were multiple uh, extension offices in our state that were called by lots of consumers, lots of gardeners, uh, small farms saying, what do we do with this? What do we do about our spinach? Uh, is it, you know, the people were asking, is it safe to grow spinach? Should we be eating any greens? Um, the, the spinach industry took a huge hit across the country uh, that took more than 10 years to recover from. Um, so it, 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 it's, it is a big deal. And we've had a lot, uh, you know, a, a few more big problems since then. Another one was the wisteria outbreak in cantaloupe back in 2011. Um, was a huge, you know, had, had, had huge problems with that. Romaine lettuce, you know, romaine calm, nice joke, but uh, for four years in a row, romaine, there's been a romaine lettuce outbreak of E. coli coming out of the Southwest uh, right before Easter and right before Thanksgiving. You can almost circle the calendar and say when it's going to happen. Uh, it's when a lot of romaine lettuce is ordered for 
um, the holidays. Uh, it comes out of that particular part of the country. Uh, it's been contaminated. It's, there's been a lot of implications about contaminated irrigation water uh, out of canals as being polluted by livestock uh, facilities. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, E. coli can, be, can adhere to dust and be blown for miles. Uh, and that's an, another thought of why this romaine is, uh, these facilities, these romaine growers are having such a problem because uh, of their, their location downwind from large uh, livestock facilities. Next. So uh, as Yolanda has mentioned, uh, for some growers, uh, there are federal regulations that must be followed, um, you, know, it, you know, to the letter. And we are, we are working and on trying to train work uh, farms uh, across the state, across the region, across the country. Um, about how to how to navigate these regulations and, and how to, how to put those practices into play on the farms. Uh, but even if you're not, you know, if, if you're if you're qualified exempt or if you're excluded, it's still you have to do whatever it takes to prevent people from getting sick. You can still be held liable, even if you're excluded from the regulations, even if you're qualified exempt from the regulations. If somebody gets sick, and 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 the and the inspector and you get inspected by the Department of Health or FDA, or somebody that you know, if if there's negligence, uh, then there's uh, you you'll, the farm will be held responsible. So in essence, all operation anybody growing produce that's going to be sold. Uh, needs to know about food safety. Next. Um, yeah, so this is, you know, if your growers want you to do it um, and you want to sell to those, I mean, not growers, excuse me, buyers, if buyers want it, want you to follow a program uh, and to get into their markets, then it, it, it's no longer a voluntary program for you. It, you know, it becomes mandatory. Uh, and Wegmans was a perfect example of that. Back in 20, in, uh, before 2006, uh, they were, they wanted the growers to, to, to start following gaps, but it wasn't a requirement. The spinach outbreak in, 20, in, in 2006 uh, changed all that. They, be, they made it a requirement. And then eventually it went from gaps to harmonized gaps. And then they, now they still want harmonized gaps as well as FISMA training. So uh, that, that's just one example of, of, a, of a buyer that's, that's really pushed for that. Other, other buyers are, are satisfied with a GAPS um, audit and certification. Um, so yeah, it's good to check with, um, with whoever you're, you're selling to if it makes a difference. If you some of the farm to school programs are requiring GAPS um, because uh, they accept federal money from USDA uh, and then there's the uh, New York Fresh, uh, Grower Fresh, whatever that program is, uh, also requires it. So if you want to be involved in that program, uh, you need to get some gap, uh, be gap trained. Next. Uh, there's, but there are other benefits. And, you know, we all know time is money and, and doing food safety is, is another added layer that you have to deal with. But, uh, you know, what we've found over the years is that uh, following some of these practices also helps improve overall quality, especially storage quality. Um, and, and it helps with uh, improving efficiency on the farm because uh, there's record keeping uh, involved in that, which is yeah, in itself time consuming. But if you <clears throat> collecting the information and using it to your benefit, uh, that, that, that's, you know, we'll take any little benefit that we can get. Um, it, it will improve wildlife management. So maybe you, you reduce losses um, from, from animals. So you have more marketable yield. Um, and then you, uh, you can create what we call standard operating practices, that that, which are really like a recipe card of how to do certain activities or certain practices. Um, and by you know, writing those down and having workers follow them, uh, you, you actually, it can streamline the farm tasks uh, and, and making them more uniform and, you know, that, that the work is getting done and it's getting done properly. Next. So 
So as mentioned before, how does produce become contaminated, you know, from people all the way through uh, animals, water, soil, uh, equipment, tools, surfaces, all of those things uh, can, can, can play a role. Next. So uh, you want to reduce the, the the key here is prevention and and and, the, and to make that happen you you know we're looking to reduce microbial contamination of fresh produce uh, and and understanding how how you know how these micro microorganisms work uh, and you want to uh, assess the risks of your practices uh, and then you want to have some you know good cleaning and sanitation uh, done on a timely basis. Uh, for the, and the people who are handling the produce uh, on the farm, uh, that they that they're they're not sick, um, and you know, and that contamination doesn't occur from 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 poor handling practices. We want wildlife management, and you know, maybe it, you know, your wildlife might be rodents, might be birds. Uh, you know, we always think of deer and and whatever, but it can be small things that, that can be just as destructive or can cause uh, significant contamination. And then, uh, you know, having record keeping. Uh, and then it's a, if you're doing organic certification, you're probably already used to that. Uh, and and it's, a good, it's a good financial uh, tool also. Um, I also teach um, cost of production and, and pricing. Uh, and so we, you know, record keeping is an important piece of that. Next. Um, so uh, we just go over real quick, you know, some 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 easy easy wins. <laughs> what what can you do uh, to to really help prevent contamination? Uh, one of the biggest is uh, improving hand washing, especially after eating, drinking, smoking, whatever the, the hand to mouth sort of thing, uh, or you know, touching things that that may be contaminated. A really good hand washing regimen uh, can do a lot. For reducing contamination, it's thought that it that it, it could reduce contamination upwards of eighty percent. Uh, so you know you're more than more than halfway there if you can get everybody to wash their hands properly and timely. Next, uh, there's also uh, you know if they're handling tools, people can get cut. So uh, and blood can carry. Um, Pathogens, uh, working while sick is another thing, uh, particularly like I uh, was mentioned about viruses. Neurovirus uh, is, is one of those things uh, that, that can be passed uh, uh, from not washing hands, but uh, hepatitis can be passed from someone who's sick. Um, if a toilet facility properly cleaned and stocked, uh, that can be another uh, kind of like a super spreader event. The, the, the new catchphrase over the last two years. So um, it's, an, it's important that if you have, if you provide facilities uh, that keep them uh, going pretty well. Next. Uh, dirty clothes is another one. Um, and if, so maybe using aprons, uh, boots, if you're, if you're on a mixed operation where there may be some some animals, livestock, whatever, uh, and you know when when do you handle them, and then when do you go out and harvest or 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 wash pack things uh, is is knowing when uh, you know change change out of dirty clothes or use protective uh, like overalls or 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 have an extra pair of boots, whatever. Jewelry is another um, another one of the considerations that that you know that contamination dirt can get underneath. Um, it's jewelry hard to wash. Next. Again, I uh, already mentioned handling animals, uh, both uh, wild, stock, wild or de uh, domesticated uh, pets uh, can, can be a problem, cats in particular. Um, we mentioned about uh, uh, parasites, cats can carry um, plasmotoxic. Uh, I can never get that one right. Um, can carry uh, parasites again? It can be an issue. <laughs> Toxoplasmosis. There we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next. Uh, tools keeping things clean. You know, 
One, one, one thing that you can think of is uh, food contact surfaces. Where does, where does the food come in contact? Uh, you know, is it, you know, it's, it's harvest spins, it's harvest tools, you know, it's hands. Uh, it's if you're washing any produce. Uh, so it's, it could be, it could be the sinks or tanks. Uh, if you're just, if you're just packing. Uh, so it could be the, it could be your sorting table um, and, and whatever is, is you have to really look at these things uh, with that, that, that eye to food safety and kind of just examine where, where does produce come in contact with? It could be scales, um, you know, salad spinners, all those types of things. Next. And then education and training. So it's great if you know it, but if you have workers, you need to try, you know, get that information to them so that they understand it. Uh, and, and workers can be anybody, family members, volunteers, you know, like if you're running a CSA and you've got You've got some uh, members uh, who, are, who are, you know, help with uh, the, the packing. Um, if you have interns, whatever. Uh, so going to, going to a GAPS training course can help you, uh, even if you don't need an audit and, cer and certification, just learning about the practices and, and then maybe sticking around for, for writing a, a food safety plan for your operation. Because if you, write, if you write it down, you know, it becomes more real and something to follow. Next. Water is another big uh, area that, that, that's, that's, that's critical when it comes to uh, uh, contamination. Uh, we need water to, to you know, keep plants alive and thriving. Uh, and depending on your operation, there could be different sources. So uh, we'll just touch on that uh, here. Next. So if you if you do any sort of field production um, uh, or growing anything outdoors, uh, irrigation may be necessary, but particularly during the dry times. Um, so the, and, you know, water is used for, for lots of things out in the field. Next. Um, if, if, you're, uh, if you're closer to, to a, a, a bigger town or a city, uh, you may be getting municipal water. Uh, so that's routinely treated and monitored for water quality. So that that's uh, you know is is what we consider lower risk, um, you know practically none whatsoever. Safest source of water to use for per, for produce washing and under the regulations and under uh, most of the food program food safety programs like GAPS and harmonized GAPS, uh, municipal. Uh, Municipal water is, 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 is the source when it comes to washing produce. Next. If you have wells, uh, wells can be used, uh, but it should require testing uh, to make sure that uh, the quality of the water is uh, in, in good shape. Um, if you're just using it for irrigation, then the quality may, might be a little bit less. If you're gonna wash produce with that same well water, then it's gotta be drinking water safe. <laughs> so getting it tested uh, is, is important, uh, making sure that it's uh, maintained properly. So like the well head is capped, uh, there's no obstructions, there's no water, uh, there's no runoff seeping into it um, and, and things like that. And, and so we consider well water to be medium risk, can be, can be low risk if, if, you, if you've got a history of good water tests out of that. Next. Surface water is probably the highest risk. It's because there's lots of things can get in there. It's exposed to the environment. You know, so there's, there's lots of things can, can be going on in there. It requires, uh, you know, it, it, it can be still used for irrigation. It would require more testing uh, from water, water labs. Um, so you can get back some numbers that you're looking at generic, you know, quantitative generic E. coli numbers uh, that are under a certain range. Uh, and, you, and you usually test enough times to get a baseline throughout the growing season. So you can see if it fluctuates and then you try to assess what the problem might be and, and see if you can make corrections. Um, so uh, there's a, we, can, we can talk hours on water. So we'll, let's just move on. Next. Um, so uh, there, there's lots of, like I said, there's lots of ways that, that water can become contaminated. Uh, fields can become contaminated also from runoff from, from some of these things. 
So it's it's important to understand, uh, you know, your 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 surface water sources. Let's just leave it at that. Next. Um, so uh, you want to assess your risks, no matter which water uh, source you're using. Uh, how is it being applied? Uh, so if you're, like I said, uh, wash, washing fruits and vegetables or, and, and cleaning uh, food contact surfaces, you want, drink, you want it to be drinking water safe. If you're looking to use it for uh, you know, irrigating out in the field, uh, then the quality is, is, a, is a little bit lower. Uh, but then what plays into that is how close uh, to harvest uh, the last uh, dose of irrigation water was, was applied. Um, so the, that timing of application becomes critical. Under the federal regulations, there's a, a whole, they're totally reassessing their water uh, quality um, requirements. Uh, and, and so we're looking probably in the next, you know, they're, they're taking comments right now uh, from, from in, uh, growers and uh, ed, uh, extension educators and researchers uh, to, to get a, to, to have a reasonable approach for, for, for assessing the risks and, and the water quality aspects. Next. So, uh, I mean, just talking about irrigation, uh, drip irrigation trickle is gonna be less risk uh, because it's just seeping into the ground around the roots. Um, and as long as the, 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 the drip tape isn't leaking or spraying out, uh, you know, it, it's taking that, that poor quality water that, that, that might be in, in, in the surface source, uh, like a pond or, or a creek or something, uh, and, it, and it's going right into the ground. Whereas overhead uh, is, you know, it, water, water drain, you know, it's like rain. So it's dripping down onto the plants. Uh, if, if you're growing like leafy greens, it might accumulate in there. So um, some of the research has suggested that bacteria can survive uh, under certain conditions uh, for, you know, five, six, seven days. Uh, so its application versus harvest date is it becomes more of a consideration. Next. So water testing is, uh, is can be an important tool. Uh, like I said, it establishes that baseline. If you if you if you're testing like three or four times a year uh, from surface water. Um, so uh, if you're getting uh, if you if it's if it's town or city water, uh, the the testing is usually done by by the company. There's usually a small amount of chlorine uh, in in the water to uh, try to con, uh, keep bacteria down. If you're looking at wells, you want to at least do two times a year. Um, if uh, you know if you're drinking out of that, then you want to make sure that 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 you're looking at uh, uh, its uh, presence absence, or or you or you can get a a, a generic. A quantitative generic E. coli test, uh, and, and the number that you want would be zero uh, on that. Uh, if it's just for irrigation, uh, then you, you want to, you know, the numbers then are, are a little, little less important, but you still want to keep them down, uh, you know, follow that baseline to make sure that they are, uh, that they're, they aren't too crazy high. Uh, surface water, you want it a minimum of, of three times, and it could be more, um, depending on um, you know, what might be going in there. If, if you have regular runoff from a neighboring farm or, or from, you know, or, or from a road or something that goes in there, you might want to, you might want to test more often and see, see when the numbers go up, you know, what's, what's going on when, if the numbers go up, you know, is there something specific going on? Uh, often we see spikes uh, during uh, like, like goose migration and, or other birds coming, coming through. Um, we sometimes we see spikes during hunting season uh, when uh, hunters are, are, are dressing deer out and, and dumping stuff in streams that, that feed uh, uh, farms. So, you know, kind of gross, but, you know, that happens. Next. Uh, animals. Uh, we should try to exclude 
animals from our production areas, uh, particularly when it's close to harvest. Uh, they should be excluded from packing areas. Um, and, uh, you know, before, particularly when you're ready to, to start packing uh, or washing and packing. <clears throat> so you need to scout uh, to make sure that everything is clean, ready to go. Um, you know, trying to prevent things from, from getting in there is, is really important. Uh, and if you've got to pick your own operation, uh, try to restrict visitors from bringing pets uh, in, into, that, into that situation. Next. Uh, dealing with wildlife. This is always a tricky one, um, but if you're scouting for insects and diseases out in your field and scout for wildlife intrusion, um, see, see when's it, when it comes, uh, how often, is there a pattern? Uh, if, there, if it comes during close to harvest, then you're gonna wanna try to, um, you, know, you wanna really scout just before you're ready to pick to make sure that nothing's been contaminated. If there is uh, contamination there, then you need a plan on how you're gonna deal with that. Are you gonna cordon off an area? Uh, you tell your workers not, you know, using, using those like little uh, metal flags with, um, and, and flag it off or, or tape it off or something. Tell the workers not to, not to harvest in that area or whatever. So, you know, if you're going through one of our trainings, we go into a lot of detail about that, but, but monitoring wildlife is, is another critical area uh, that, that needs to be considered. Next. Soil amendments. Uh, this is another area uh, where contamination can easily occur if it's um, applied, uh, if it's made with raw manure or improperly, uh, um, if, if the composting um, program we have doesn't completely compost uh, things, you know, manure that, that's been added. If it's a total vegetative <coughs> type of uh, compost, then, uh, you know, your risks are a, a whole lot lower. But if you start using raw, an, uh, raw animal manure uh, of any type in there, uh, then, then there's considerations. You don't want to apply it too close to harvest. Um, you want to make sure it's stored properly so there's not, not, not any runoff or people aren't walking through through that area and then going out into the into the field or you know where you know if you're growing you know where, wherever you're growing uh, crops making sure there's no runoff or wind spread and having separate tools uh, so um, that uh, you're not accidentally contaminating uh, your 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 freshly harvest products next and as, as mentioned before um, and if you're if you're washing product or or, or cleaning uh, food contact surfaces, the water you use is it, it, it's potable, uh, drinking water safe, um, so that uh, you know you're not you're not spreading contamination. Uh, so that that's that's really important uh, in there. So. Um, and then uh, you you know making sure that everything that you you know all your food contact surfaces are are cleaned, sanitized, that would be a big help. Um, you you want to you want to be able to to remove dirt, uh, soil, whatever that's stuck on there, um, and vegetative matter, whatever. Uh, clean that off before you you go in and sanitize. When the reason for this. Well, Let's step back one second. Yeah, thanks. Um, is because uh, that any any of that kind of organic matter that gets dried, you know, particularly if it gets dried on there, or and and becomes like really really hard to to remove. Number one, it becomes really hard to remove because bacteria uh, can create biofilms, uh, and biofilms don't rinse off very easily. They need to be scrubbed off. Um, and, and it, this, this includes stainless steel as well. So if you never wash your stainless steel triple base sink, uh, you may have problems. Uh, so, you, uh, so rinsing and washing and sanitizing at the end of each workday, it's a pain, but uh, you're getting things off while they're still wet and fresh uh, before it dries on there and becomes a really, uh, you know, a, a monster to clean because it takes a whole lot more time. Uh, so, you know, clean it, clean it on a regular basis, 
Uh, and then when you're done cleaning, follow it with a uh, approved food sanitizer. Next. But prevention is the key, uh, as we've said uh, throughout uh, these presentations. Um, you want to you exclude the, the, the pests. You want to do whatever it takes um, to, to keep out birds or rodents from wherever it is that you're working, uh, where produce is going to be. Uh, get rid of your coals and dump your trash. Uh, keep things up off the floor, away from walls. Um, maybe you might, you know, if you've got birds coming in, they're roosting up on uh, in the rafters. You're going to put netting across there. Um, you want to keep the floors clean. You want, if you've got drains, you want to clean those out. Um, so uh, you're doing everything you can to avoid cross contamination. When it, when it comes uh, to, to uh, the, the, the packing and washing, if you wash uh, produce, uh, but the packing and, and storage, really important. Next. Um, so uh, here's, a, here's a, some information. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the GAPS agricultural program, uh, you know, good ag practices program in New York, uh, the, the whole, that is uh, run by uh, New York Department of Ag and Markets. They, um, if, you, if you're looking to get uh, an audit and a certification out of that, it's a yearly thing and it's inspected by, by these guys. Uh, they really are great to work with. They, uh, they know farming and they're not out to screw you over. They're there to help. Uh, and uh, mo uh, a number of states have similar programs uh, set up. Others don't, uh, but it's uh, but they're all based uh, out of uh, on the USDA GAPS program. Uh, and in New York, uh, we're we're kind of lucky in the fact that there is a reimbursement program uh, for for uh, for GAPS, um, and and there's uh, information about that um, on their website, or you can contact their offices. Um, and, and they'll, they'll gladly help you out. Or if you need any more questions, if you have any more questions, don't hesitate, uh, give me a shout. Uh, definitely, uh, I'm happy to help and, and can do you know, whatever I can virtually, or if you're in my area, I, I you know, can even stop by. Okay, I think that's the last of my slides. All right, there's a couple of questions I'd love to bring up at this point, if that works. Yep. Yes. So, um, go ahead. Um, I have sort of a question of do gaps vary by state? And what does that look like? Gaps, uh, well, like I said, gaps, uh, good agricultural practice program. It was created by USDA. So, every state that uh, offers uh, that audit and certification is following that same program. Uh, how each state trains growers, if they train growers, not all states do, but uh, it, uh, we, you know, we have developed our training based on the, the GAPS program and following um, the, the, the checklist that the auditors use. Um, so it's, it, it, there's different ways of saying the same thing, but the outcome is the same. If you're looking just to, to learn about food safety and good agricultural practices without an audit and certification, the training is still extremely helpful because it, it does that. But it also gives you that background to, to, if you need to get an audit to, to go forward. But if you wanna learn about food safety, I mean, the, taking one of those courses is, is a good way to do it. And just that sort of a follow up on that, I think is just just to clarify, what's the difference between completing a gap certification and the third party gap audit? Are those always hand in hand? Are they separate? How do you how do you describe those two things? Okay, um, it, it's it's um, a the let's see. It, then the the different the real difference in that is like like in New York, we have our, our Department of Ag and Markets is is. Uh, what's the word, sanctioned, licensed under USDA to do the audits. They're approved by USDA to do the audits. So, uh, so you can use though that, that resource to do it. If you 
if you don't want to, you can hire a third party, an independent party to come in and do that. Uh, there, and, and depending on what your buyer wants, they may require one, a, a very specific one, like there's, there's Primus and, and, and a bunch of others. So they'll gladly come out and, you know, you, you, you set that up and uh, they're very, very expensive. Uh, but they'll come out and they'll, they'll do an audit uh, of, of what you're doing. Um, but that's a, that's a business uh, in, and they're, you know, they, so they're, they're just looking to, you know, to see if you've, you know, if you've done, if you followed their, you know, what their program is. Uh, I mean, they're all, they, they, there's a lot of them that have their own very, very specific program, higher levels than what the GAPS program is. Others are, uh, other third parties can do a GAPS program um, as well. I mean, just, just the following the USDA program. Um, so, uh, but generally um, we, you know, you know, here we, like I said, we're lucky we have, we have the state that, that'll do it. Um, and uh, the, you know, you're, you're paying for it, you pay them by the hour uh, and there's an application fee and, and, and some other fees to get going. But at least uh, we, we have that reimbursement program here uh, so that, they, that you can get, you know, up to, I think it's up to $700 uh, back. Uh, so it, for a small operation that, that more than pays for, uh, for your first year uh, um, certification. Okay, and then a question just to clarify about some of the water elements. Um, are there any dangers of water from from a hydrant that's, I guess, opened and stored in a covered 55 gallon drum used for irrigation water cycled through in less than a week and usually refilled twice a week? So uh, depends on what was in the drum prior. Uh, is the drum sealed? Uh, it if, if it's cleaned and sanitized, then it, it might uh, it, that might be adequate. Uh, is it if is it just being used for irrigation, or is it being used for uh, you know if it's being used for irrigation, then it's really there's there, there's no problem. If you're looking to use that water to clean, um, it it. it there, it, it's hard to, to, to say every time that it's going to be, you know, it, it's going to be free of contamination. So it's not, not knowing, you know, just exactly where it's kept and how long it is. Uh, if you're looking to get an audit and, and, uh, and the, the auditors are going to look at that and probably say that that's not sufficient, that would be considered surface water, kind of. Um, and, and would probably need to be tested. Uh, so, it, it, or just used for irrigation. Um, so it, where it becomes more critical if, it, if you're trying to use that water to, to, to clean and sanitize or you know, come in contact with food contact surface or produce after it's harvested. Okay. okay. And then one last one for now, um, particularly to mushroom cultivation, there's a couple of different ways that water is used in, in production that I'm curious to just hear your comment on. One is, in outdoor log cultivation, growers are sometimes soaking logs to force them to fruit. In um, I've seen everything from a stock tank filled with water. It can be surface water, it can be pond water, it can be well water, and then even natural bodies of water. So that's one way it shows up. The other is in indoor cultivation systems where there's a, um, a humidification misting type system to maintain high humidity. And I'm just curious if those would both fall under quote unquote irrigation and any sort of, um, I think with both of these things are sort of what the reg, what the audit might pull up as a concern, but also then just best practices for growers to think about in those cases. All right, um, just just so that I'm clear on that. So just we'll start with the with the logs. So after the logs are have soaked, kind of in general, what's the time between between the water, the logs coming out of the water, and and when you, the the mushrooms are harvested, typically about a week. At the, the the shortest interval is usually maybe five days, but typically a week or so as the log is 
sitting out there and, and the, the mushrooms are starting to emerge. Wow, okay. That changes my answer then. Um, uh, and these are, all right. So then I'll, further clarification. Then are we talking about mushrooms that are um, not eaten raw? Well, <laughs> hopefully <laughs> there sh they should not be eaten raw, but as I've, as, as I've experienced and I know from growers, um, that's not always um, how the consumer interprets what mushrooms should be. Because sure. shiitake should definitely be cooked, but a lot of folks think they are like a cremini and they might as well be put on a salad raw. So, and, and, yeah. and it seems like under the raw food list, it, it is still kind of listed there. And mushrooms are potentially something that can be eaten raw, right? So there's that element of it, I guess. I would, I would think, um, all right, if, if, if you use, if you, if you're using stock tanks or, or any sort of container that's been cleaned and sanitized before filling with water and the water that's being used is municipal, then it doesn't appear to, to me that there's that, that, that the, that the risk is that high. I think where we start running into a problem might be when if you're if you're using like a, a surface water source um, that um, so there's a degrees so if, if if it's a pond or or very slow moving water uh, and you're not sure what's upstream that might be more risky than something that's got fast moving um, st stream or, or creek. Um, and then it, it, it may not be quite that, that same problem. So, uh, and, and this is my opinion, okay? Uh, I think we would need very, uh, it would actually, I would defer, <laughs> kick the can down the road, uh, defer to ag and markets to see what their, you know, how they would handle that, uh, you know, from an audit standpoint. Um, you know, with being that, that amount, with that amount of time, um, and, and not knowing like how, you know, what happens with that water once it's inside of the, of, of the log, does it, is, is there some, is there some micro, microbiological um, chemistry going on uh, that might um, reduce contamination or does it enhance contamination? you know, by providing a warm, damp environment. Uh, you know, that I, I'm, that's, a, that's great questions. And, you know, I will follow up. I'll, I'm actually gonna, I'll, I will contact USDA mushroom people uh, about that one. Uh, but that's a great question. Now, the other scenario you had about, um, about mists and, and, and the high humidity, that, that's a, I, I think that becomes more critical about having potable water. Uh, a drinking water safe um, aspect because the, because of the humidity and 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 that that you're keeping you're keeping the environment very very wet um, not just um, you know for all around so it it may so there, if there is some contamination it there could you know surface contamination may it it, it may keep that bacteria alive uh, or, or, you know, it, uh, we're talking bacterial contamination, then, then I think that that environment may keep it alive. Um, I don't know, like with the log where, you know, it's translocating up from, from, you know, in, in the log up into the, into the fruiting body. Uh, I'm not sure how much that, how much that would occur. And I don't know if the research is there at this point to, to, to back that up. I know they've tried to do, you know, take a, like a flooded condition uh, with bacteria and, and grow like kind of a hydroponic situation, try to force uh, spinach and other greens to uptake bacteria. And it looks like that if they really try hard that they, they can get the roots to take it up, but it doesn't seem to get translocated up into the leaves. Um, so it's, it, I, I, I'm not sure how it plays out with, with, with mushrooms, but I would tend to, to think that the, the high humidity in indoor sort of setup might be a little bit more risky. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks.
Great, let's transition to Hannah. Hi everyone, let me get my screen share all set up. Can everyone see this? Yes, thank you. Great. So hi everyone, my name is Hannah. I'm the Director of Operations at Smallhold. And I put together a presentation to tell you all a little bit about who we are, why we chose to pursue GAP certification. I was asked to represent farms that have gone through this process for you all. Um, walk you through some recommended steps that I put together knowing what I know now as a GAP certified farm. And then I'll quickly talk about some other certifications we hold and hopefully have some time at the end for questions. So a quick introduction to Smallhold. Um, we were founded in 2017 and our mission then and now is to grow local mushrooms everywhere that we can. And to do this, we build and operate climate controlled macro and mini farms. So an example of our macro farms can be seen here in the lower left. This is our facility in Brooklyn. This is a facility that we operate in Buda, Texas. And an example of our mini farms can be seen here in the lower right. This is a mini farm that produces about 20 to 30 pounds of oyster mushroom, mushrooms a week. And it's on the floor at a Whole Foods in Gowanus, Brooklyn. Um, and we are specifically a specialty mushroom farm and we're also certified organic. Uh, we've had a lot of success and growth over the last five years since we were founded. And I actually was employee number one at Smallhold. So I've been with the company through it all. We currently have three farms, one in Brooklyn, New York, one in Austin, Texas, one in Buda, Texas. And this year we're launching our first West Coast facility in LA. We've raised several rounds of funding and you can find our product on the shelves at stores like Whole Foods, Central Market, Fresh Direct, Safeway, and more. You know, all that said, we've had some incredible growth, but we, we have very humble beginnings. This was our first farm ever. It was a 160 square foot container farm on the East River in Brooklyn. And we were only operating out of this and a handful of mini farms when we began preparing for GAP certification. So why did we do it? I think a lot of these will echo what's been previously covered. First of all, we don't want anyone ever to get sick from eating our product. I think everyone here as a food producer can relate to that sentiment. That is a nightmare of a problem and the first reason to put a food safety program in place. Second, you have to standardize and create a bunch of documentation around your protocols in order to get GAP certification. And this was something that we were planning to do anyway. Now, this was an important step along the way in our ambitious expansion plans. And this just gave us double motivation to do that. And last, you know, as a few people have said, some customers do require GAP certification or another third party food safety audit. And we wanted to be ready to get on the shelves with a customer like Whole Foods really quickly and not have to wait a few months getting our certification in place. So a big motivation was to, to head off those customer requirements. So I spent some time thinking about you know, what I wish someone had told me when I was initially tasked with getting GAP certification. And I put together a series of recommendations for how you might approach this process. Before I get into my tips, there were a few caveats that I just wanted to put out there. Um, you know, we are a producer of a single type of crop. We grow exotic mushrooms and that's it. And I think the GAP certification program is really designed for more traditional farms that might have multiple crops, many fields of production. And for them, the process is gonna require more documentation and be a little bit more robust. Since we're growing one thing, that really streamlined our food safety needs. We also farm indoors and in controlled environments, which lessens certain food safety risks. So for example, just by enclosing production, you're less exposed to weather, less exposed to pests, don't have to worry at least too much about wildlife. Um, we also, you know, another caveat I, I do want to call out is that we only produce specialty mushrooms. And for that reason, we were required to complete the general GAP-GIP audit. 
there is a mushroom gap audit that is specifically designed for people who are producing button mushrooms. I believe that the reason that these audits are separated out is because of the use of manure in button mushroom cultivation. So there's some extra protocols that need to be put in place and extra things that you'll be audited against if you are growing button mushrooms. Um, and you know, one thing also to keep in mind as, you're, as I'm going through this is if you're like us, a lot of the requirements in the audit checklist won't necessarily apply to you and, and that's okay. The way that the audit is scored is by looking at the applicable applicable points that you can earn and what you earned against them. And if you're not applicable for anything, it is not included in the audit process. And you know, th there might be some healthy dialogue with your auditor about what is and isn't applicable. Um, but there are, it is likely that there will be several fields that are NA if you're anything like us. So where to start? I, I don't know about you all. I don't know where you all are in your food safety plans, but I found this to be this amorphous, overwhelming task at first. And um, I'm here to tell you it's tackleable. It's not that bad. The purpose of a food safety program is to look at every step of your process and minimize the chances for contamination where, wherever you can. And essentially what a food safety program is, is just so much documentation. And a lot of my recommendations to follow are all around creating and identifying that documentation that you need. The best piece of advice that I can give anyone is go to the USDA website and download the GAP GIP audit verification checklist. This is the same checklist that your auditor is going to use the day of. So you know, there's no better study guide than that. There's no better tool that you can use than that. This is a snapshot of that checklist. And as you can see, for any requirement that requires a supporting document to prove conformance, they have identified what type of document the auditor is going to be looking for. So a D in this column stands for document, and that's a kind of catch-all category. You can satisfy this requirement with an SOP, a policy, or a record. So for example, looking at G1, a documented traceability program has been established. I can see here that the document that the auditor is going to be looking for is a document. And an example of a document that you can provide to satisfy this requirement is your recall SOP. The second one is R for record. That's required when you need to prove that an action was taken. So G2, the operation has performed a mock recall, recall that was proven to be effective. To prove that you did this, you're going to show your auditor your recall log, specifically one that you filled out when you were completing a trial recall or a mock recall. Um, and you know, my approach to these is just to approach that process how you would a real recall and take notes on what went well and what opportunities there are for improvement and then make those changes in advance of your audit. And then the, the final required document is P or a policy or an SOP, for example, I can't see it just because my Zoom stuff is here. All employees and all visitors to the location are required to follow proper sanitation and hygiene practices. So they're going to be looking for P, a policy, to prove that you are following this um, direction. And so your action is to create your employee and visitor hygiene policy. And if I were doing this again, this is where I would start, like I said, read it from start to finish. It's, it's a little long, but there's a lot of duplicate questions. And as you're reading, start identifying the documents that you need to create. And another thing I'll say is feel free to borrow language directly from this checklist. In fact, at times I have found that auditors really like that. So for example, during our first gap audit ever, our auditor wanted me to show him where we had the exact statement that's outlined in P2. The operation has designated someone to implement and oversee an established food safety program. So as a follow-up, I created a food safety contact form where I copied and pasted that and then put my own name. So feel free. You know, I think there's a lot you can pull from here, for example, to create your employee and visitor hygiene policy. And there's nothing wrong with using work that already exists.
The next step that I would recommend that you all do is create your farm maps. This is something that the auditors are going to look at before they even arrive at your facility when they're reviewing your food safety plan to get a basic understanding of how you operate. So put together map or maps uh, that represent all of your facilities and show the way that food is and, and your process is flowing through your space. This is a really nice representation of the flow of food at our facility in Buda, Texas. It doesn't need to look like this. It doesn't need to be color coded. You can hand draw these and scan them and submit them as part of your plan. And that's more than acceptable. The next step that I like to recommend is to sit down and actually map out the flow of your process from raw materials to sale. And the reason I recommend this is because, as I said, the purpose of this audit is to look at every step of your process and identify opportunities for minimizing the chance of contamination. So a really strong place to start is just mapping out what that process entails. And that is a really helpful tool to have as the foundation of your program. And this is why. A really, really big part of any food safety program are SOPs or standard operating procedures. And the purpose of these is to provide step-by-step -step instructions for how to complete a task while reducing the chances or minimizing the chances of contamination while that task is being done. So look at the process flowchart that you've hopefully created at this point. And for any step in the process where you think logically that a food safety risk might exist, highlight the SOP that you're going to write to detail the precautions you're taking. So for example, one of our process steps, mushrooms are harvested into totes. I'm gonna write a harvesting SOP that details the proper flow of operations, washing your hands, putting on gloves, making sure that you're only using clean and sanitized equipment and food contact services. That's what you put in your SOP. And this is, I found a really effective way for identifying the SOPs that you need. There will be certain SOPs that you are expected to have no matter what. And as you're going through the audit checklist, these will begin to jump out at you. So just to list the ones that I've identified that I believe there's just no way around are hand washing SOP, illness and injury SOP, harvesting, delivery, recall, handling and disposing of finished produce, which is a complicated way of saying, you know, composting product that might've been contaminated, glass and brittle plastic breakage, which is you know, really geared towards more traditional or larger scale farms that are harvesting with mechanical equipment that might break and contaminate product, but is a requirement for any operation. Cleaning restroom, cleaning and sanitizing surfaces, as well as equipment, cleaning delivery vehicles, and cleaning and disinfecting bodily fluids. Bodily fluids are a hot button topic in food safety, and you will definitely be required to show your SOP for addressing any injuries, as well as cleaning up after said injuries in your SOPs. Um, the internet's your friend. You know, once again, there's a lot of existing content out there that you can take and then make your own. When I was starting this process, I actually used a lot of the materials that Cornell provides, um, downloading their templates, fleshing them out to make them reflect our own operations. But I found that really helpful for helping me outline SOPs correctly and not having to start from scratch is great. The next step that I recommend as you are writing your SOPs is to identify the corresponding logs that you will need to track the activities that you're completing through that SOP. Um, so for example, for the harvesting SOP, an, an accompanying doc would be your harvest log, which I assume anyone who's growing food is keeping records of what they're producing. Um, you can reference that log in the SOP. That's a really key part of your traceability program. Another thing I recommend is as you go, you might find it's easier to pull a bunch of requirements out of the SOP itself and identify policies that you would like to implement. So for example, instead of including in our harvesting SOP that harvesters with long hair need to tie back their hair before beginning work, we have a harvest policy that states that and our SOP simply says, 
anyone completing this task must be familiar with all of our must be familiar and compliant with all of our harvesting policies. That's a tool I like. I like to keep SOPs streamlined because I find that they are more usable in that case. Um, and just something I think you know, could be helpful for all of you. Just like SOPs, there are logs and some policies that you will be required to have. The glass and brutal plastic log, illness and injury reporting log, worker training log if you're employing people, cleaning log, cleaning logs really, because there's a lot of equipment that needs to be cleaned. Restroom cleaning log could fall into that category. Thermometer calibration log if you're using thermometers, harvest risk, uh, harvest risk assessment log, pest and rodent control log, recall log, and visitor log. So the final part of the audit, which oddly is a six part audit with seven sections and no part six, the seventh part is your food defense plan. A food defense plan is a written document where you outline everything that you are going to do to protect your food from acts of intentional adulteration or intentional contamination. Um, if you are processing food and not just farming and packing, you are going to be required to register as a, a food facility with the FDA. Hopefully anyone who is already has registered, but if not, you will need that registration number to show on the day of your audit. A food defense plan includes several sections. There should be a section around outside security measures or what you will do to prevent unauthorized access by people or unapproved or unexpected materials from entering the facility. Inside security measures, this is around protecting your product from intentional contamination by employees or whoever else has access. Personnel security measures, um, this is about ensuring that only authorized personnel have that access to your facility. And then the last section, incident response security measures, is how you will, what measures you have in place to respond if there is a contamination threat or event. Lots of information online about this. The FDA has some guidelines that they provide as well. And it's, this is another area where you don't need to start from scratch. The last thing, just to bring this back to that audit checklist, the last thing I'll recommend is that before or before you schedule your audit or while you're waiting for your audit, audit yourself, you know, go through the checklist, answer yes or no, see what your weaknesses are and improve upon them before the actual day of your audit. Um, this is the best way that you can prepare and then you will be really confident going in and uh, know exactly what to expect from your auditor and where you might be losing some points. Um, another just final tip on this is that the first thing you should do when your auditor arrives is ask them to show their ID and sign into your visitor log. Visitor log is one of those required logs. If you start off on this foot, they're going to know that you did your work and they're going to, it's going to start the audit off on a really good foot. Just quickly to talk about some other certifications that we hold. We're also certified organic. It sounds like maybe there's some folks in the room who have organic certification, but don't have GAP certification yet. If you have neither, starting with GAP prepares you very, very well for getting organic certification. It's similar in that this audit's gonna look at your production process from start to finish. And um, this is really focused more on the materials that you're using, if you are applying something to your soil or to your, your crop, what are you applying? Are they compliant? And participating in this program means that you will need to get approval from the USDA for all of your cleaning and sanitizing agents and anything that you are applying. Um, because you know ultimately that's what organic pro the organic program is all about. It's about assuring customers that the product they're buying were grown with organic pro uh, processes and don't have pesticides or, you know, unwanted things on them. Um, and, you know, this does make traceability extra important. You, anything you're making organic claims on needs to be traceable from seed to sale. You need to have that same level of traceability for GAP. So, like I said, if you've already done GAP certification, this is a pretty easy thing to tack on. 
And then another certification that we hold is New York State Grown and Certified. If you have, if you're growing product in New York State, which I assume most of you are, if not all, and you have a third party food safety certification already, such as GAP, the last thing you need to do to get the certification is work with your local soil and water conservation committee to do an environmental assessment. And this was for us very, very quick. We had two questionnaires sent to us by our local committee. We filled it out with the positive impact that we're making on the local environment and the local community. And we were very quickly admitted into this program. So if you would like to add the certification to your products or make it known that you are growing in New York State, this is a, a pretty low hanging fruit thing that you can go after after you've gotten GAP certification. And that's everything I had. Um, feel free, you know, if you have questions, shoot me a note. I am very excited to have the opportunity to help others where I could have used some help way back when. So don't be shy and I'm an open book if you have anything you want to talk about. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you to um, you and Robert. I wanted to just um, put in the chat box too, well, a few links, but also just encourage anybody who has a question to feel free to unmute themselves or type it in the chat box. I do have a question in the chat box if anyone would like to read it. Okay, so that's what about produce that's harvested in order um, to order at a small farm? So what about it exactly? Like if you're saying if a customer visits the farm, produce is harvested, then then and there given directly to the customer. like. Are you asking if that should be a separate SOP or if there are specific practices to make sure that that's safe? Uh, the latter, basically. Uh, how uh, do we need GAP? Do we need to, you know, would it be worth doing for such a small farm to to do that sort of thing? To, um, to do GAPs or to... To do GAPs, to, to, to do many of the things that have been discussed here other than the obvious the sanitation, the hygiene, uh, the things like that. Um, sorry, I'm not being clear. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think it all depends on what your goals are for the gap um, specifically because it is in buyer imposed program. If you are selling at a farmer's market or you wanna sell at a local co-op or- Farmer's market, it would be a weekly farmer, farmer's market. Okay, if they require gaps, and obviously that would be the incentive to go ahead and get that certification, but also it could be part of your marketing too. If you have gaps and let's say um, a buyer doesn't require it, you can say that you've taken the additional step to ensure that your mushrooms are safe. So there could be additional marketing benefits as well if it's not a requirement from the buyer. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And Hannah, feel free to chime in. I was going to say the same thing that it, it really comes down to your your goals as a farm and what opportunities you're pursuing. Thank you both. No problem. Okay, well, we're just at time. I will put in the chat box my email. Um, if anyone has any questions and would like to follow up. Um, I saw that there's a few people from, not just from New York. So if you have other questions, um, I can connect you with your local extension office, whatever state you're located as well. 